Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of The Bison Hour. I have the extreme pleasure to have Angela Mir on the podcast. Angela was born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee. Yep. Um, she is a loving mother of four children. Uh, Angela has owned multiple businesses from custom wedding gown designs to selling bags um, and making manufacturing those bags um, to owning a gourmet shave ice business. Mm -hmm. And now most recently here in the Oklahoma City area, Boomtown Creamery, which you guys are about to open up your... Well, we're about to open up number two and number three. Ooh, um, okay. So that is going to happen pretty quickly here in the next couple months. So I'm we're excited. We are so excited to have Angela on the podcast um, just because she, she does really represent um, what the spirit of the podcast is, which is being the bison and heading into the storm. So thank you for being on. Yeah, I'm excited to, to be you. here. So tell us a little bit about how you grew up. Tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. And uh, we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, sounds good. So... I grew up in Tennessee, um, you know, pretty, pretty great childhood. There's some, I feel like the, one of the things that kind of marks my childhood is my parents got divorced when I was five and, um, there was, you know, it was, it was hard, um, dealing with that. They were, it wasn't an easy divorce, but other than that, you know, I had, a, I had a great growing up, great friends. T Tennessee's a fun place to live. Um, I will say that Nashville's way cooler now than it was when I grew up. <laughs> now it's like the it place to yeah. go and be and everything like that. But, you know, um, so yeah, so grew up there, um, had a real strong desire to leave Tennessee. Um, so I went to school on the East Coast. So I actually went to art school. Growing up, I was kind of the... Uh, uh, I was, you know, the one who was always in student council and in charge of things and kind of like always kind of fell to that leadership role. Um, Just out of curiosity, yeah. you're not the second oldest, are you? I'm the oldest. You are the oldest. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'm a firstborn. Yeah, for sure. And I have a brother who, um, and then a half sister who's 13 years younger than me. So there's just three of us. Awesome. So you're like the leader of your family. Yeah, I, for sure. I've always kind of felt. And then I ended up being student body president in college and, you know, just all the things like that's just I always kind of end up being in charge. You're an excellence <laughs> achiever. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So grew up in Tennessee. Yeah. Um, Tell us a little bit about uh, what happens after high school, because mm -hmm. you do have a long story and long career mm -hmm. and everything like that. Um, tell us about how you met your husband, um, how you got your family started, and how you started your first business. Yeah. So um, I went to school at Rhode Island School of Design. Okay. It's an art school in Providence, Rhode Island. It was I went by myself. I'm totally that person that like doesn't I I can be the, the only person in the room that I know, right? Like I, I can go into any situation and kind of make friends and get to know people and talk to people. Um, I'm a big people person. So went to this school on the East Coast. It was a little bit of a shock for a Southern girl. <laughs> the, um, New England is much different than Tennessee, but it was fun and it was hard. Art school is like so different than a normal college experience. You instead of like studying all day, you're making things and you're making things in like all night because you've got deadlines and you're, you know, so I went to school for fashion design really thought I wanted to be a fashion designer. You mm -hmm. know, 18 year old me, 17 year old me was like obsessed with fashion, read Vogue cover to cover every month, which just really thought I was going to be a fashion designer. So go to school for it. Um, during college, I was home for a summer and met my husband um, at church and he was in Tennessee working. He was selling pest control. And so we met at church and we dated long distance actually for um, two years mm -hmm. and got married and he moved out to Rhode Island for my senior year of school. And then kind of probably what I kind of felt like was I knew it was the right decision, but it was probably a little bit of a heartbreak for me um, in the beginning was when we graduated school, all of my friends went to New York or L.A. and mm -hmm. got jobs in the fashion industry. Everyone did. And I moved to Kansas City, Missouri. And at the time, you know, where is that? Like, who knows? Yeah. Like everyone's mo moving to these major cities, getting major jobs with major fashion houses. And I'm moving to Kansas City to follow my husband to start a business. And I knew it was the right decision. 100 percent. I knew it. But there was still some FOMO there for sure. Sure. <laughs> so when we moved to Kansas City, he started his business and I decided to start a custom um, wedding gown business. Mm -hmm. um, because I that was my senior thesis, was making a line of wedding gowns, and I loved the wedding industry, um, had some history of it in high school, and so wanted to uh, make custom wedding gowns. And so I did that. I probably made in 20, 2008 to 2010, made probably like eight gowns. Um, 
got pregnant, had my first um, child in 2011. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. And um, brides are kind of crazy people, like uh-huh. normal people who are engaged turn sure. into crazy people. And it was just a lot of stress. And I think I was slowly realizing like, I didn't love fashion design. Mm -hmm. Even like it was like it was starting to like I was realizing that like, oh, maybe I don't like love doing this. Mm -hmm. And I really don't love doing it when there's like these people are putting such high pressure on me. Mm -hmm. So I stopped taking bridal clients and was like kind of I just kind of closed that business Uh, during that same time period. And I should stop and say, I kind of had a like creative ADHD, right? Mm-hmm. Like I'm like, what all can I do? Like, what can I do to do to make things and make money? And so I started making all of these um, different things. Like I would make little dresses and tote bags and random, you know, headbands. And I would go to the farmer's market before I had the first baby in 2011 um, and just sell things at the farmer's market. Mm-hmm. And one thing that I was selling were these burlap coffee bean sacks. Mm-hmm. Um, And I turned them into tote bags because there's a cool roaster, coffee roaster in Kansas City. And they would just give me these burlap sacks. And every Saturday at the farmer's market, they would sell out. And so it was like, so the business entrepreneur mind in me is like, oh, people, people like these. Like, Mm -hmm. we should focus on this. Like, if I take all of these things to the market and this thing sells out every week, like, that's what we're going to focus on. So then I started making those and had some history with, like, understanding wholesale. So I decided to go to Las Vegas market and sell to you know, sell wholesale and get wholesale accounts. Mm -hmm. And um, had a baby at this point. I'm like, the timeline all gets kind of fuzzy when you. Sure. Yeah. (laughs) It's just a blur because you were in the grind phase. Yeah. And so I in 2011 and 12, I think we sold over like 4000 bags. Mm -hmm. We had accounts in Japan and Tokyo. It was really cool. Like there was this major department store in Tokyo that was selling these bags and um but I was making them all and I was, you know, employing my husband for free. Were you guys just making them in the garage or something? Out in of the, the house? basement. Okay. Yeah. And like they had grommets in them. And so like my husband, he would come home from like running a pest control company and at night he would just Matt would just like grommet. <laughs> And like he would have blisters on his hands from like grommeting bags and he never complained. He's amazing, you know. And I think the other thing about this company that was so interesting was like I didn't even like these bags. Sure. Like I thought that I like they were fine. They were cool, but it was like people it was, like them. It was something you would never carry around yourself. No. Yeah. No, like I they're no, totally not my style. Mm-hmm. And so it was like it got to be kind of a beast, right? Like it was like we got to feed this beast, we got to make these bags, but it's not creative. Mm-hmm. Like I'm a creative person. Um, and so I just was like, and then I was also, I got pregnant again, had mm-hmm. a baby in 2012. And so at the end of 2012, I was like, okay, no more bags. Like we're going to finish these orders and we're closing this company. And so at that point it kind of was like, especially business wise, entrepreneur wise, it felt like I'd done these two businesses that were like, like financially not successful. Sure. You know, like not really, they were, they kind of filled my time, but they weren't really successful. Sure. And to be honest, I could only do them because I had a husband supporting me, you know, like if I had had to pay bills off of what I was doing, like it wouldn't have, you know right. what I'm saying? Like, so I have a question for you because yeah. I like already there's so much to unpack with what you just said. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a movement in our world today that women should focus on their careers and go out and get jobs and everything like that, which my wife is, um, one who wants to be in the workforce mm-hmm. after being a mom. Mm-hmm. And, my question to you is, what do you have to say to, I guess, the people that think that getting married and being a mom and being able to dominate a professional life, like, how do you manage that? And like, what advice do you have for young women out there? Because mm-hmm. I feel like there's not enough push to still be a mom, to have kids. And then on top of that, dominate business still. It is possible. Mm-hmm. You're you're a shining example. So how, how, I guess, did you navigate that yeah. situation and that challenge? Well, I think one thing I didn't learn until a lot later on is that I needed help. Mm. Um, I think that's the, that's the key is like, so I was, especially with these first two businesses and having really young, like I was babies, like my first two were 18 months apart mm-hmm. and I was trying to do these things. And I, I thought that I could do it all at once without anyone's help, you know, other than Matt, who was also working a full-time job. Right. And so we, so, and I think that's probably a reason why they did didn't really, I mean, I, there was other reasons, but one of the reasons they didn't really succeed was because you can't juggle all of that and do it all on your own. 
Like you can't, you know, especially with like the age of the children where they're at home. Like I was staying at home with them and doing and trying to make a bunch of bags every day, you mm-hmm. know, like, OK, I'm going to like, you know, feed you and get you, you know, going with some toys. And then I'm going to go over and so, you know, so for an hour while you're playing and then we're going to stop. It was like a constant stop and start. Right. right. And so I think it pre- like that part prevents your like ability to really succeed Mm -hmm. because you like I should have had some babysitters come in during the day you know I should have like there's a lot of things I should have done but I didn't want to because of their ages right so there's just like a trade-off um then as we move on like I quit the bags and just started focusing on blogging so I had an internet um blog that's actually still out there um it's handmadeintheheartland.com and so I was like you know what I can do a blog and not have to worry about like deadlines of shipping bags and you know all these things Mm -hmm. and I can still like be at home with my kids. And that was great. That was fun for a while. Um, It like helped me like release all of the creative like ideas that I had, you know, because I could like like there's one of the posts on the blog is these baby booties. It's a sewing pattern for little booties to go on babies. Okay, sure. And <laughs> um, that post like still makes me money. It's funny because like people still search that and see it on Pinterest and go to it. And then the next day I could like do a recipe, you know, and put that up. And then because it's just like a creative lifestyle blog. So it was like anything that was in my head that I wanted to do, like I put it up on the blog. Um, and so I learned, you know, I learned how to get my photography skills really well. I learned how social media skills. Yeah. Like there was all these like things that I learned blogging. And I could do it with kids. So it's like also figuring out like what you can do. Now, I would say I would have probably made a lot more money a lot quicker if I had had focused time. Because, again, it was like this like stop, start, start, start. You're just in the funk of it trying to get everything. It's kind of like the cartoon where everybody's beating each other up in the cloud. Like you can't even see what's going on. You're just trying to get through it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then yep. in 2015, so 2012, um, stopped any of the sewing, you know, like, let's just say like sewing businesses, stopped those. No more bags, no, no more wedding dresses. Yeah, no more bags, no more wedding dresses. Um, and then, yeah, we just, I just focused on the blog, had another baby in 2015. My husband sold his pest control company in 2015 and decided to go to dental school. Fun. So, um, so that was, so we were like, okay, we're going to school. And then in 2016, I think that's kind of like a pivotal year for us. We, we just had this business deal that went south and we were expecting a lot to have a lot more money, Mm -hmm. um, in the bank for dental school than we did. Mm -hmm. And kids were a little bit older. Um, and well, Ruby was only one, but, um, so, we had this moment where we're like, we're in a home, a house that had a house payment. He's going to dental school. Um, we had four kids at the time, three, three kids. at Yeah. The time. We had a kid okay. in dental school. And then you were just blogging. I was blogging. So you're blogging. He's like, let's go back to dental school. Obviously yeah. sold the pest control. Yeah. You know, uh, and so we had a little bit of money coming in for every month from the pest control company, which was amazing. Sure. Um, but it wasn't enough to, um, stay in our house if we were going to stay in our house. And I mean, like dental school, we were like, okay, we're going to have to take out loans for dental school. But like, okay, we have to make a decision here. Like we got to move, downsize, you know, really like cut costs for during these four years of dental school. Is this in Kansas City? Mm -hmm. So you guys stayed in Kansas City and went to dental school in Kansas City. Okay. Okay. And I was like, part of me is probably my pride. And I really loved my house. And I was like, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. Um, and so we had, we had $30,000 in our savings account. That was it. And or was it 20? It was not a lot of money. And I was like, you know what? We're going to start a shaved ice business. And he was like, what? And I was like, he, I was like, it's going to take everything in the savings, but it's going to work. It's going to work. I know it's going to work. Like I had already had this idea before this whole kind of catastrophe hit us. Um, I had like in our little suburb of Liberty, sure. we didn't have any shaved ice. Like in Oklahoma, you think that's crazy because in Oklahoma, there's literally shaved ice on every corner. Sure. But like in Kansas City, there was none. We lived in this great suburb and there was not a shaved ice place. And I was like. I had done research already and was like, we can, I mean, I can get this business started all in Mm -hmm. for 20 to 30,000. Like Mm -hmm. I know I can like start it and I know it'll be successful because I know how to do photography. I know how to get people. Like I just, like my gut told me like, this will work. Well, you had spent the last probably six, seven years acquiring the skills necessary to get a business. And it sounds like the other yeah. businesses weren't as successful as you would like them to be. No. But you were able to acquire the skills necessary to learn how to run For sure. a successful business when it comes to the shave ice. Yeah. Um, 
on the on the note of shave ice. Yeah. Where did the idea come from? Like like were you just thinking one day like ah uh, that's the no one. you know I went to a business down in South OKC. It mm-hmm. was um it's actually a Utah franchise called Hokulia and it's like a truck and they do shaved ice and they put ice cream in it and mm-hmm. I was like. Oh, this is a great idea. Like, like similar to like Bahama Bucks yes, or something? Yes, just okay. like Bahama Bucks. Exactly. Uh-huh. And I was like, there's nothing like this in the North. Like there's nothing like this by us. Like, and it would kill. Like mm-hmm. it would do so well. Like the, there's nothing, there's no competition. Like there was some shaved ice, like, you know, maybe five miles from where I wanted to sit, maybe 10 miles. Anyway, but it was gross. It was like crushed ice with like gross syrup. Like it wasn't good, you yeah. know? And I'm like, I know this would work. And so I have the funniest story I have about the shaved ice business, though, is like the week, I guess it was maybe two to three weeks before we opened. I had I had this idea in my mind. So I'm a very visual, creative person. Mm-hmm, right. Mm-hmm. And I had this idea in my mind that so most shaved ice is sold in styrofoam cups. Okay. And I was like, our cups have to have our logo on them. Because then when people take pictures of our cups, and this was 2017, um, so like it, it was a little before like the huge branding, you know, I feel like everyone's like super focused, hyper focused on brand right now. And right. Um, anyway, I was like, we have to have our logo on our cups. Because then when pe- people take a picture and they share it on Snapchat, because that was, you know, at the time, the place, um, or Instagram, or wherever, they're gonna wanna come to our shaved ice. Mm-hmm. And so that was my whole marketing plan. I wasn't going to advertise anywhere. I was just going to post, you know, organic posts on Instagram and Facebook and do Snapchat. And um, <clears throat> I wasn't going to do any advertising. I was just going to do make sure all my photography was like spot on and this logo was everywhere. Mm-hmm. And about two weeks before we opened, um, we were running out of money. And Matt was like, you spent how much on these cups? Because I didn't, I only ordered like a thousand. Sure. And when you order a thousand custom things, they're I think they were like sixty cents each, which is sure. crazy. Well, price per unit compared to stuff with no logos is yes. Yeah. And it was like five cents for a plain cup, and I paid like sixty cents, which we got the price down when we ordered a lot more. But he was like, "What? Like you spent how much money on cups? Like mm-hmm. what are you thinking?" He was he was like, "We're gonna lose our house. This is we're like he was he had no faith uh, at this point. He was just stressed, you know." And the night we opened, there were five hundred people that showed up and waited in line for our shaved ice. And it and it didn't quit. We actually ran out of ice because you have to it, it, anyway. You have to make big bricks of ice, and, and like it, the first month was just wild mayhem. Mayhem People couldn't get. So th- the story is incredible because I don't think a lot of people appreciate the situation that you guys were in. Backs against the wall. Three children to provide for. Husband is like, hey, you know what? I'm gonna go to dental school. My stepdad was in medical school basically his entire life. I know firsthand there is no money when your dad's going to medical school yeah. or dental school or anything. Yeah. You're taking out loans just to survive. And you guys have 20 grand, whatever the yeah. amount of money, nominal amount of money that yeah. it was, and dump it directly into a business. Yeah. So yeah. opening day, 500 customers. Yeah. What were your emotions like when you saw that? So I was at the register hmm. and Matt, my husband, was at the ice machine. Okay, and I am so elated. Like, I am just like, hi guys, like I'm just taking orders, you know, and Matt's got lines of cups. He's just got lines of cups to fill. And we've got staff in there that, I mean, it is a mess. And I'm just taking, and he's like, you gotta stop taking customers. I'm like, nope, we're gonna keep taking orders. Like, I'm just like so happy. And he's like, we don't have enough stuff. We had to send a kid to our house to get more syrup. Like, it was crazy, but I I mean, that's just kind of me. I'm like, this is, I mean, it's crazy, but I'm like, I am a glass half full, all the way full, all the time. Like I have a super positive outlook on life and I knew it was crazy. We were going to have to figure it out. But I was just like so excited that it worked, right? That it was like, I knew it would work and it worked, you know, like it was, it was a really fun moment. And I think that business, you know, it it just continued to succeed. It was Mm -hmm. awesome. It was the first time that I felt validated, you know, like, cause it was like financially, it got us through dental school. We didn't have to move, yep. you know, um, and, and then I was able to sell it for a profit when we left Kansas city. Mm-hmm. And so it just was like this, like, I can do it, you know, like this works, like my ideas can work. And, um, it was just a really good, it was a really good experience. So, so this, the shave ice business mm-hmm. is a massive success at this point. Um, how did you scale that business? Did you guys have multiple locations or walk walk us through yeah. the success? Of, were there any struggles or yeah. was it just like, so yeah, yeah, tell us about all this. Yeah, I think I learned so much. Um, I learned that I really love a food business. Mm-hmm. Like I, I really enjoy food, like working in the food and, well, I wouldn't say working in the food industry. I really enjoy running a dessert business. 
I really enjoyed working with teenagers and training people. And I liked the whole operating of the business. It was Mm -hmm. fun. Um, I didn't like how it was because it was like a temporary shack. You know, it was just like in a parking lot. Right. So much of it had to operate out of my house. Mm -hmm. You know, like everything was operating. My house was just like a disaster. We had all these freezers in the garage. And we, you know, I was... Anyway, there was just a a lot of things that... I, when we moved down here, we were like, oh, should we do shaved ice again? I was like, no, I do not want to do shaved ice again. Right. You I know? don't want the chaos at home. No, I just, and, and there's there's so much competition here. I was like, no, that's over. It was really, it was really cool to be able to sell it to my best friend and continue to be a part of it. Just like, I mean, I think that first summer we talked every single day. Mm-hmm. And then, and that first summer that she owned it, 2020, which was a, a, weird year right she opened a second one that year wow. so she opened to like right off the bat she opened a second one um and so it was just it was really fun to still feel a part of it give her advice help her with things you know um continuing on but i think i learned i learned so much about social media and how to get people engaged and get people in to buy you know the product mm-hmm. um that was a huge thing that was like oh yeah i can do this you know um Oh, and I also had a baby during that. And time. you had a baby. Hey, yeah. congratulations! One of the, actually, on the I had in 20, 2019. So it was our third summer of doing it. Uh, I had a baby July first. Okay. So which was like the worst time to have a baby, a baby in, in the middle in of the summer when you own a shaved ice business. Yeah. Like it, <laughs> but we did it, and the, you know we had experienced staff at that point, and so it was fine. But it's it quite literally the worst time since July fourth. Is three? That's July fourth weekend. Yeah. No, no, no. The day two days after he was born, my husband did a shaved a festival like a fourth of july um like firework festival it wasn't on the fourth it was like the day before the fourth but anyway he did and like i wasn't there i mean he had to like run this huge festival and i was calling him from the hospital he's calling me from the like i'm at the hospital and he's like where is this and what do we need to do with this and you know asking me questions (laughs) it was it was chaos so something that i obviously welcome to the episode and this is our 10th episode but of all the entrepreneurs that we've had on um they have a couple I guess, character traits in common. And one that's shining through is you guys, you and your husband were willing to sacrifice short-term, I guess, pleasure for long-term gain. Mm -hmm. And as you're telling your story, there's so many times where you just sacrifice more and sacrifice more and sacrifice more, sacrifice more. And I'm sure your kids have had to sacrifice and your husband's had to sacrifice and you've sacrificed and everybody's sacrificing. Where do you feel like that spirit comes from to want to continue to double down, sacrifice comfort Mm -hmm. for the chase of success because up until this point shave ice was the first first endeavor and you guys four kids deep husbands in dental school you know this has been a a, you know eight to ten year journey up to this point Mm -hmm. with little to no success and you guys are still doubling down on the sacrifice tell us about that where does that spirit come from (sighs) Mm, i don't know i mean i think it's more (laughs) Yeah, you should ask Matt that question because for me, it's like I have a really short term memory or something because I'm like, let's go to the next idea. Let's get like I I think a lot of it is I don't have a lot of fear. Mm-hmm. Like when people are like, oh, but that's, you know, like, how do you know it's going to work? And I, I don't I don't know it's going to work, but I don't have a lot of fear um, of failure. Mm-hmm. I just keep going. I, I'm super, you know, it's just I'm it's such a blessing to have a husband who is willing to support all of my crazy ideas, Mm -hmm. you know, um, and keep going. I will say too, though, you know, I feel extremely blessed by the support of our families. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's something like, for instance, Boomtown, we couldn't have started Boomtown without investments from our family. Sure. And, you know, that's just like, it's, it's privilege, right? Like I am privileged to have a family who was able to invest in me. I don't think the banks would have given me a loan without, I don't think I would have been able to get a loan for Boomtown. And so I think that's something I can't not acknowledge is Mm -hmm. that I have, like, I'm blessed with that ability to have family support Mm -hmm. and husband support too, right? Like I have this support network that allows me to chase things and keep going. I also have a real like grit in me that I'm like, I don't want this to fail. I'm going to, I'm going to like with bridal and with the bags, I kind of pushed it through to the end as far as I wanted to go or far as I thought it could go. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, okay, I don't want to do this anymore. And we're not like, it didn't, it didn't produce debt or anything. So we're going to, we're going to bow out, but I kind of have this, like, we're just going to keep going and we're going to make adjustments and change until we make it right. 
And it doesn't sound like your other businesses were necessarily failures as much as it was you just lost interest in them. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. uh, what's cool is your resiliency and your tenacity to just make things happen, which is also a very unique quality. Um, but yeah, it just blows my mind the amount of sacrifice you guys were willing to go through for so long with so many kids just to have that one little taste of success with the shave ice. Mm -hmm. So you guys move here to Oklahoma. Your husband's practicing dentistry, mm -hmm. you know, supporting the family. How old is your youngest child? Right now, Teddy is three. Okay. Yeah. So Teddy's three years old. It's still really young. He'll um, be four soon. Yeah, almost uh, four. Oh, man, I wish I was in that. Our youngest is one years old, and yeah, it's, it's, it's still a struggle. Yep. <laughs> um, but uh, three and four make all the difference. Yeah. So you guys moved to Oklahoma. Um, when did you start Boomtown? How long were you guys living here until you were like, you know what? Yeah. I'm just, I have this crazy idea. I'm going to open up an ice cream shop. Tell us about that experience. Yeah. So we moved here in 2020. Terrible time to move. Um, and I actually, I was feeling really just kind of like anxious. Like I was still blogging, but I just was kind of like, I was honestly, I was kind of done being at home full time. Mm -hmm. And I actually got a job at Hobby Lobby Corporate. Um, in 21, I got a job as a designer and it was my first like job. Yeah. Like, I mean, for work, I mean, I had had other part time jobs, but I had never like gone working for someone else. No, because when I graduated college, I just started my own thing, you know, mm -hmm. like. And so I was like, I'm going to get a job and Hobby Lobby Corporate's here and they had design positions open and it was a great experience. I learned a lot from it. Um, and just some things happened where like my well, I mean, I got bored. Let's be honest. I got bored. <laughs> And, um, and you know, there's things about working for corporate that as an entrepreneur, I wasn't used to, you got to work those 40 hours. You got to be there at the desk the 40 <laughs> hours, you know, it was, I mean, definitely some challenges for me. I loved the people I worked with. Like it was, it was overall a really good experience. And, but it was October of 21. And so we lived here for a year and a half, almost, you know, ish. And Matt and I love ice cream. We love ice cream. And in Kansas City, there was a, a, a ice cream shop called Betty Ray's. And it, we literally, it wasn't a date if we didn't end up at Betty Ray's. Like, we went there almost every single weekend, okay? And it's really good ice cream. It's handmade ice cream. Right. And we just went there every single weekend. And we moved here, and we tried all of the ice cream. Yeah. I mean, literally, we tried every single place that has ice cream <laughs> in Oklahoma City. And we were disappointed. Yeah. Like, we were just disappointed. It wasn't, like, I like chunky ice cream. Like, I like cookie chunks, and I like things that change. And I just like really good ice cream. Uh, Betty Rice has a peanut butter that I would get every single time, peanut butter ice cream. And no one had a good peanut butter. And I was like, I want my peanut butter ice cream. Yeah. So I'm, like, working um, at Hobby Lobby. I took off for a weekend in October to go visit my brother in Sarasota. And um, he had just had a baby, so I was visiting him and the new baby. And we were in this ice cream shop, cute ice cream shop in Florida. And I was looking around, and I was like, oh, if I could open up any business in Oklahoma City, it would be a cute ice cream, a really good ice cream shop like this. And my brother looks at me, and he's like, why don't you? And I was like, I don't know how to make ice cream. And he's like, you figured out shaved ice. And I was like, shaved ice is sugar and water. Like, it is, yeah. it is easy. Ice cream is science. Like, I don't know how to make ice cream. And he's like, I'm sure you could figure it out. And um, so I think that was Friday. I, on Sunday, I'm leaving. I'm at the airport. I'm sitting in the airport. I haven't stopped thinking mm -hmm. about it. And I call Matt, and I'm like, I'm going to open an ice cream store. And he's like, another food business? And I'm like, yes. And it's going to be the best damn ice cream in Oklahoma City. And he's like, okay. And um, and so my original goal was we were going to open in January of 2023. Or spring of 23. Okay. I was like, we're going to open in spring. This was 21. I was like, I'm going to next year, I'm going to really plan it out. And mm -hmm. I don't have any patience. That was that was never going to happen. But I found, I think what happened in November, it was November. So a month later, I'm at work board and I'm looking at real estate listings, commercial real estate listings. And I find the perfect spot. I find our spot. And I send it to Matt. And he's like, I think you need to learn how to make ice cream. And I'm like, oh, I'll figure it out, you know. And so then the next day, I found a commercial ice cream workshop in New York City for two weeks later. And I emailed it to him. And I texted it a link. And I said, hey, can I go to this? And he's like, sure. Like, he knows. He, like, it's just funny because he knows, like, when I have an idea, like, there's no stopping it. Like, it's like, it's going, it's moving. Like, hopefully he can like make sure that we're, <laughs> you know. There's nothing stopping you. Yeah. It sounds from the phone call, Matt, I'm starting another yeah. ice cream business. He's like, <sighs> yeah. a business? Yeah. All right, yeah. okay. Because there's nothing it. that's going to stop yeah. you. It, yeah, he, yeah. So I went to this ice cream workshop in New York and um, with a man named Malcolm Stogo. And he 
invented cookies and cream ice cream in 1978. Yeah. I wish I could shake his hand. I know. What a I know. Stud. He's like the, he's just this, he's um, just kind of an ice cream legend and he does mm -hmm. workshops with, and you learn everything you need to know, right? Like he, he takes you, it's like a three day workshop and he teaches you how to make ice cream from scratch and like in his little basement, like, like he has this like ice cream little factory in his basement, production facility in his basement. And you go in there and like, it's just, it was just, it was exactly mm -hmm. what I needed. Like it was exactly what I needed to know to then like figure out how I was going to make my ice cream, you know? And so, yeah. Yeah, I think that like if if I stop right there, it's like a lot of people have the idea, right? Mm -hmm. Like this town needs a good ice cream place, sure. you know? Or like I cannot tell you how many people came up to me when I was doing shaved ice and said, "Oh yeah, we were going to do that." Like, "Oh yeah, we thought about doing shaved." Like, I mean, I would be rich mm -hmm. if I had a dollar for every person. Everybody has the idea. Right. And it's like I guess that's where I'm a little different is I'm like, if I have an idea and I really feel strongly about it, like, I'm just going to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to make ice cream, but like, I can figure it out. Like, yeah. and you can figure, I didn't know what triple net meant on a lease. I didn't know how to read a PL statement, you know, mm -hmm. like I didn't know these things, but like, you can do it yeah. if you like put your mind to, I mean, that's just where I am is like, I'm going to figure it out. If I really want to do something, like I'm going to figure it out. Yeah, I think for a lot of people that want to get started in the world of business, the hardest step is the first one. It's just make the decision. You know, a lot of people would have looked at the workshop in New York mm -hmm. and not purchased the plane ticket or got on the flight to actually go to it. Yeah, It's exactly. like, well, we have the office building. You need to learn how to make ice cream. Mm, a little bit too much work. Like, I yeah. thought this would be easier. Yeah. Um, I love that you have the ability just to get things done. And that's... Quite literally, every entrepreneur, you figure it out as you go. You got to roll with the punch. You just got to yeah. be resilient enough. There's always going to be things you don't know. Yeah. And you're always going to come up against challenges. And so you just have to have like the, I don't know, like the attitude of like, okay, let's figure it out now, yeah. you know? And I think there's some humility in it too, is like, I don't, I like, as I see people who like maybe don't succeed because they're not willing to be like, I need to learn that. Mm -hmm. I need to change that. Okay. You know, I can't tell you how many times my staff in the last six months have like come to me with like, hey, we really need to know this or that. And so I'm like, oh, I haven't been communicating that well or oh, I haven't been doing that well. So I'm gonna change mm -hmm. how we're how we're operating. And like, it's a continue. And I, I tell our staff in every staff meeting, I'm like, we're a new business. There's gonna be continual change. I need flexibility on your part and I'm gonna be flexible for you guys. Like we've gotta keep growing yeah. and changing to be successful. Yeah. Um, so tell us about how the whole ice cream process started. Were you just yeah. in the kitchen and just yeah. like, let's start this thing and, yeah. and let's go for the flavor. Yeah. So you went to the ice cream workshop. Yeah. You came back from that workshop and did you tell your husband like, okay, I got this thing figured out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, I was yeah. like, yeah, I was like, we're doing it. And then a month later we signed the lease to our, our 23rd street store. Awesome. Um, I mean, there was an, great landlords there um, who helped, you know, but also, okay. In the, in the middle of that is, asking family for money mm -hmm. <laughs> for, for loans, um, which was, you know, nerve wracking, but also a blessing because they said yes. And we're able to fund us um, some money of our own, obviously, and then family money. So we're able to get it funded and start working. Construction never goes smoothly. Right. Like so the, during this whole time, I'm wanting to open by May 1st. Mm -hmm. I, actually, I wanted to open in April because I'm like, I signed the lease in January. Let's get going. Like, let's let's build this thing. Hammers don't start swinging until March. The construction process is super stressful. I hate it. It's the worst part of this business is dealing with construction. I just hate it. I just don't like it. <laughs> it always costs more and it's never on time and it's never smooth. Um, but during that process, I was, I was, you know, planning the business, planning the flavors and trying to get my menu how I wanted it. So I had this little countertop ice cream machine. Mm -hmm. You can buy them on Amazon. It's one that you don't have to freeze the bowl. So if you, if you're really interested in like home ice cream, get one that has a, con a condenser in it. So you don't have to freeze the bowl every time. Cause that's oh, yeah. just super annoying. So, um, I would just like, I would have these ideas and I would just test batch them because I already had this, you know, these base recipes to start from, from Malcolm 
welcome. And so I would just start testing all these different recipes. One recipe that never made it in, I tried it, I think five times, was peach. So peach is really hard ice cream to make sure. um, because peaches have a lot of water content versus their like flavor content. And so the, the ice cream always gets icy and it never really tastes good. And so you have to use fake peach flavoring and fake peach flavoring is gross and I don't like it. We don't use fake flavorings in our store. And so um, anyway, so I kept testing. I really wanted a peach ice cream and it just never happened, you yeah. know, but yeah, that's how we. That's how we started is I just kept testing all the flavors and I would get one that I liked and I'm like, okay, now this is a small scale. I think the really crazy part was I would scale up the recipe, but I didn't have my machine yet. Right. And so my machine arrived, construction has pushed and pushed and pushed. So now we're in June. And so by the time my kitchen is, re- I hoped to have two weeks mm-hmm. to make ice cream in my kitchen before I opened the store. I ended up having four days. Yeah. And so I had four days. I, I mean, I just worked. My... A good story is during that time when we first opened, my kids came down to go to lunch one day with my husband and my dad and stepmom were in town. And Ruby, my seven-year-old, walks in and goes, oh, is this where mom lives now? (laughs) Because they had not, because I would get up and leave and be at that store before they arrived, before they got out of bed. And then I wouldn't come home until after they were in bed because I was Uh just like, we have to have the ice cream to serve people. Like it was, it was crazy the first month. Wasn't like Steve Jobs or I think, I can't remember who it was, but they kept a cot in their office just so they could sleep and wake up and keep working and sleep and wake up. I considered it. Honestly, I can sit there was a, there's an empty storage area Mm -hmm. in our, and Matt and I, cause I was so tired. Like I was so tired and I was like, if I could just like take a nap for an hour and then get back working and like, we considered taking the camping cot, but I never did. I was like, I can do this and then come home and sleep and get back, you know, and it only lasted for probably five weeks Mm -hmm. of like madness where my kids didn't see me. So like, I don't want to be the mom that's never home. Right. That is definitely not my goal. My goal is to create a sustainable business that I could actually walk away from for a month mm-hmm. and everything would still run smoothly. Like the goal is not for it to be Angela running the show all the time, making all the decisions. I want to empower, I want to hire great people and empower them mm-hmm. to be able to do their jobs well. Um, but in the beginning, you just, there's no way around it. Yeah. I think my first business I spent, I was working 18 hour days for, I sent my wife to Europe for like a month. I was like, hey, just get lost because you're not going to see me. So she yeah. took herself and the kids there. But um, yeah, I think it's a really important lesson for entrepreneurs to understand, like, if you want to make something successful, you have to be willing to do mm-hmm. everything that you can. Yeah. Scratching, clawing, yep. biting, kicking, punching, like whatever you can do to make it happen. So uh, opening day at Boomtown, what did you guys do? And did you do any pre-marketing or mm-hmm. what did you guys do before? Yeah. So... We definitely started off knew the importance of photography, especially with food. You want people to like look at that and want to get it. And so we started building the buzz several weeks in advance. If not, I mean, I started posting things months in advance, started doing little teasers of like testing in my kitchen. And then once we were like constructing the space, did lots of like showing the process, you know, lots of building buzz. Also, I was new to Oklahoma City. So it was really key to hire someone to help me reach out to all the influencers and media and all that. So I did hire Valona Michaels for marketing Mm -hmm. um, and I just hired her for PR. So she handled our our soft openings and getting like getting the word out. Mm -hmm. And that was like, that was critical. So opening was awesome. It was our highest sales day on record still. Um, It was, I mean, we had soft openings and just like, I mean, just amazing, just amazing amount of people posting about us. And I mean, I, I believe that my marketing plan is having a cool store, yeah. having a great product that's photo worthy. So when people come in that store, having the branded cups, right? you know, having like having a product that when people come in that place, they are like, I've got to photograph this. I've right. got to share it. Right. You know, having things that like that's still my marketing strategy. Right. right. Like it still is. It's still just like the logo on the cups with shaved ice. It's like we want people because. Word of mouth has always been the best referral, right? Well, in today's world, word of mouth is someone posting on their social media that's not paid for. Right. Right. So if I, and I can't tell you how many people like, oh, how'd you hear? Like if I'm at the register, I'm always asking people, is it your first time in? Oh, how'd you hear about us? And especially in the early days, it was always like, oh, someone posts on Instagram or you're all over Instagram or you're all over TikTok or, you know, all of these things. Like that's where, that's where people see you. I, I met an accountant actually who lives near the store 
And he was like, I've come in your store several times and there's always a line. He's like, but I only know about you because I drove by you. He's like, I haven't seen any like newspaper. He's like, normally new businesses I find out. He's an older gentleman. Sure. He's like, normally new businesses I find out traditional ways. And I was like, well, what are those traditional ways? He's like, I don't know, newspapers, signs, you know, things like that. And I'm like, yeah, we didn't do any of that. And he's like, so how, how did you get people in here? And it's like, well, really social media, like if you know how to use it and you know how to get your customers to use it for you, mm -hmm. like that's, that's a big key. So something that you mentioned, especially on the marketing side of things, um, I know for a fact that you will not succeed in business if you cannot sell yourself or the product or anything like that. And something that you do that is just a good lesson to point out is you found a way to create an environment when your customers walked in through the door that was inviting and awesome. Like when you walk into Boomtown Creamery, you're like, this place is really cool. The vibe in there is really yeah. amazing, right? Yeah. Second thing is, is you give people a photo opportunity, yeah. like take a picture with their ice cream. And then the third thing is focusing on the quality of yep. the actual ice cream. So yep. you have a good product. Yep. The funny thing too is with shave ice or ice cream, I don't know anybody that hates ice cream. <laughs> like it's a product everybody can get behind. Right. It's not like trying to sell, I don't know, like life insurance or anything <laughs> like that where people it are like- is. We do have- Ice yes. cream's never going to be a scam. Nope. No, no, you're always going to love it. No, I will say mm -hmm. that I believe our ice cream is the best in the city. And I really focused. I actually, one of the things was I realized, so I made all the ice cream in the beginning, made all the original recipes. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I'm midway through the summer. I have, you know, just people helping me in the kitchen. But I'm like, I'm out. I'm kind of out of uh Idea. I'm not out of ideas of how to make ice cream. I'm out of like knowledge of how mm -hmm. to push ice cream. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to culinary school. I don't know. And I'm running a whole business. Like I cannot do all of these things. So if there's something that I can hire out, it's someone in the kitchen who knows more than me. Sure. So I started looking for a pastry chef to run our kitchen. Cause I was like, I need to not make ice cream anymore. Like I need to, I need to like, focus. To run the I need to run the business, you know, and I need to not be in the kitchen eight hours a day. And so, or longer. And so I found Kaylee, our pastry chef and probably the best decision in 2022 was hiring her. Yeah. Like she like is incredible. She ha comes up with ideas, knows how to do things, knows how to run a kitchen. I mean, I didn't know what a par sheet was or all these, you know, and she went to culinary school for pastry and she can, her skills just are perfect for our kitchen and she loves the job and we like she's such a great partner for me mm -hmm. like she's great and so that was like a huge step to get that off my plate and to know that the quality of our ice cream of our product like the purpose like the whole reason i started an ice cream store is because i wanted great ice cream mm -hmm. i mean literally that's why i wanted to go on i wanted to have some place to go on the weekend to get really good ice cream yeah i saw a hole in the market i knew that our city needed it want would like it and i wanted it yeah you know and um i think i probably more ice cream than any of our staff members. <laughs> so like I, every day when I leave, I grab a cone. So Well, you look great for eating ice cream <laughs> all day, every day. Um, so question to you, you mentioned earlier um, that you've never really feared failure. Mm. And I feel like for a lot of people, that is the one thing that keeps anxiety, fear of failure, keeps people from doing or taking any action mm -hmm. nowadays. For sure. Like I'm sure you would agree that the secret to success is just working hard and then taking action, like, mm -hmm. and rolling with the punches and taking more action and just doing that. But um, where does the lack of fear come from when it comes to you and your ability to get things done? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've wondered that about myself because I am wired differently. Sure. Because like when I talk to people like about, you know, um, ideas that they have and like their, the, like their way that their mind, cause I don't, it's not that I don't have anxiety. I, I do stress, mm -hmm. um, but I don't have like the worry, you know, like, I, I don't know. It's just, I, I honestly don't know where it's coming from. Um, but I am wired differently. Like I, when people tell me about their worries and about their stresses, I'm like, well, you know, if that happens, like, what about this? Like, well, you would do this or, you know, mm -hmm. recently. Um, so we're about to expand and um, we had to go to the bank for that. And I had this I was given this advice from um, someone that said, like, have you walked through the worst case scenarios of this deal with your husband? And I was like, well, I don't really go to worst case scenarios ever. Like in my, yeah. like, I'm just a positive person. I'm like, it's going to work out. Like it's going to work out, you know, mm -hmm. and that's not always healthy. And so I sat down with Matt and like, we talked about like, what, 
is the worst case scenario. Like, where do we end up? And it's like very depressing when you think about that. That's why I don't like doing it, you know? Yeah. But like we talked it through and how we would cope with that. And it still didn't scare me. Yeah. Like it's like, because in my mind, it's like, I would do so many things before we ever got to that point. Right. Uh, and um, so, yeah, I don't know where it comes from, but I do know that like that's part of my success is that like I can I can see the pause. I also feel like, you know, like there's something about like always like seeing the positive, looking for the positive, And then when something negative happens, you just keep you just try and do the best thing, like putting positive vibes out in the world mm -hmm. and like having good energy and try like it helps your brain, you know, come up with solutions. Recognize opportunity. Yes. Recognize solutions, recognize. Because when you have that negativity like side of you that mm. like overpowers, you know, I wouldn't say my husband would say he's not a negative. He's a realist. Right. Mm. A lot of people say that, like, I'm just a realist. And I'm like, OK, I get that. And we we all need someone in our life like that. But I'm not wired that way. Right. And I feel like it helps me come up with solutions because I'm always like, well, we got to we got to fix it. So yeah. what are we going to do? Yeah, that's how. So like we're in the middle of expanding my business from one to three right now. And my business partner said the same thing. He's like, hey, you realize if this goes south, we're all going to have to start contributing money to the business instead yeah. of, you know, taking money and yeah. distributions. And I was like, OK, that's a pretty big risk. I never looked at it that way, yeah. but we're still doing it. Yeah. And I think it's another important lesson for viewers to listen is when the cards are stacked against you, when your back's against the wall, when your husband's in dental school mm -hmm. and you have no income mm -hmm. and you have, you know, 20 grand in the bank account, you need to make that decision to trust yourself and gamble on yourself because it could be a success. And if it doesn't, mm -hmm. like you said, you'll figure it out. Yep. And I love, love, love that tenacity and that, man, that hunger. It's what attracts me to other entrepreneurs and stuff like that because a lot of people are like-minded. A lot of people think like you in that aspect that own businesses and start businesses and entrepreneur things. <laughs> um, so tell us what what the next five years looks like for Angela Mir and her family and, yeah. and where do you guys plan on going from here? So, gosh, I have a 12-year-old, which is crazy. Max is 12, and um, June will be 11 in August. So it's like we are we are in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Like we are – the move from Kansas City to Oklahoma City was hard. Um, it was really – it was a hard move for our kids. And I was like, we're never moving again. Like I am here until every one of them is done with high school. Like we are not moving kids again. Uh, I never moved growing up. I went to the same school kindergarten through 12th grade. So like I had never – had the experience to compare to and it was just it was rough on my kids so we're here we're in oklahoma um matt's practicing dentistry in yukon um loves his staff loves his office you know so he's gonna keep he's gonna keep doing dentistry and hopefully um the plan for boomtown is to you know i'll i'll go ahead and put my uh my good vibes out in the world but we want to have six stores in oklahoma right. city that's that's my ultimate goal is we want to have um right now we're building a production facility so we're we're expanding two more stores in the next couple months so we'll have three stores and we to to do those three stores we had to right now we make everything in 23rd street but it's a very small kitchen so Currently, we're, we're building out a large um, production facility with a large kitchen that is going to be able to accommodate us to six or more stores. That's awesome. So that's that's the goal is to have, you know, have six stores in the metro. I don't really and, may, and possibly uh, wholesaling to local um, retailers. But I don't you know, another thing I've learned about myself and over the if you if this if this Angela if it, with this success of Boomtown would have happened to me 10 years ago, I mm. would have said, and we're going to franchise and we're going to go nationwide and we're going to, you know, like I would have I, like, cause that's where I was. And I think as I've gotten older, I've realized like, I realized what, like how to balance things. Right? right. Like a lot of people say like, well, could you go to Arkansas or could you go to North Texas or could you do, could you do? And I'm like, yeah, we could, but like, I don't want that. I don't mm -hmm. want the pressure of that. I want to like, I want to develop a business that's successful. That's our Oklahoma city. Like when you think of ice cream in Oklahoma city, like you're going to Boomtown. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people might think of another very large retailer that, uh, you know, but I want, if you're thinking of really good ice cream, I want you to think of, you know, if you live in Oklahoma city, you're thinking of Boomtown. That's my goal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I like I don't want to stretch myself too thin. I still want to go home every day, you know, at, most days at five or six o'clock. And I want, want to be there for my kids and I want to mm -hmm. be a mom and I want to be able to balance that. Um, but, you know, 
so so that's so that's the goal is like I, I want to be you want the best of both worlds yeah. you want the business to be flowing and running but have enough time and freedom to spend time with the family and yeah, stuff like that exactly I think a lot of people a lot of young people don't realize that I remember when I was probably about 21 it was like I want to take over the world mm-hmm. that's like what I want to do mm-hmm. and I still want to take over the world because mm-hmm. I'm only 28 but, <laughs> um, I do notice that as my family grows older and stuff like that things start coming into perspective where it's like time and freedom is more valuable to me than money is mm-hmm. because money, once you make a certain amount, it's like it can only yep. get you so much. Well, there's that study that says like there's no increased happiness over $80,000 a year. Like, have you seen that study? Mm-mm. It's like there's no like there's no there's no incremental happiness. Like if as long as you like it's like the eighty thousand dollar year mark is what like it's like you can live comfortably enough to not check your bank account yeah. and people yeah. just like you know. and so I mean I think you know. It's just an interesting, it's an interesting study. So it's like, but you know what? Like you can't get more time. Mm-hmm. Like you, you know, you, you, you can't get more time. You can't get more time with your kids. You can't get more time with your family. And it's really valuable. So it's like when I look at my goals for our life, like we have retirement goals, we have, you know, mm-hmm. things that we want to meet. Um, but I don't need to, I don't need the recognition of the whole country. Like I don't need to be Ben and Jerry. Yeah. Don't I don't need it. Yeah. Like I actually I don't need anyone to know that Angela Muir is the person behind Boomtown. Yeah. Like I, I just want to have a bit I want to have a business that's successful, that the people who work at it enjoy their jobs and are treated well. Mm-hmm. And I want to be able to go home and have good relationships with my family. Like those are those are my main goals in life, you yeah. know? Um, as far as like how business relates to family. I had a buddy one time sit me down because this is I was having a really tough time just learning how to balance work since we're talking about work-life balance. Mm -hmm. Um, And he was like, he called me, he calls me Atwood, but he's like, hey, Atwood, uh, I just want to tell you, like, you got to make sure that you take care of things at home and your family because he's like, right now, success in business may be like the one focus on your mind. But he's like, if you lose your family, it'll totally disrupt and ruin your business. Like you're happy right now because of where your life is at and you don't recognize it because you're so busy and you're just focused on business. But if this all went away because you were too focused on business, Mm -hmm. you know, like it doesn't mean anything. And then he was like, you know, at the end of the day, um, even if you win the rat race, you're still a rat. Mm -hmm. And that Mm -hmm. put a lot of of perspective into my life where it's like, you know what, maybe I don't have to do as much. Mm -hmm. And I've found ways to delegate work Mm -hmm. Um, focus my time in other places, Mm -hmm. become more productive in smaller increments of time just to find that balance. But I wouldn't have figured that out if I didn't have a family Mm -hmm. that helped me learn that because Mm -hmm. I needed to, just like you rolling with the punches. I'm sure you figured out that balance because of necessity. Well, and I think a lot of, I mean, for me, I mean, to be perfectly honest, sometimes uh, mom mom life is harder than, Mm -hmm. it's less enjoyable sometimes than the business life. So I have to like, you know, watch myself that I don't overwork or that I I'm present when I'm home instead of being on my laptop because you know we I get more um, instant satisfaction of like seeing a product launched or seeing right. you know like seeing these things with the with I mean I get, I see sales increase I see like all this stuff whereas kids it's like it's a drain every day of like mm. training a three year old to be nice you know yeah. and so it's like <laughs> I have to watch myself of, of like that's it is actually more important. You know, mm-hmm. home is actually more important and I've got to make sure that I'm present at home and doing it while they're young, you know, being there while they're young and so that they still want me around. You know, they're not going to want me around when they're yeah. older, but, you know. So, but yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's something that we can all fall into, male or female, is like disappearing and kind of hiding inside work because work actually gives us more instant satisfaction mm-hmm. than raising a family. Yeah. Because it's harder. I mean, it's it's just harder. Like yeah. we like we talk about all this hustle with our businesses, and it and it's but it's it's like rewarding mm-hmm. um, most of the time. Whereas like family stuff is can be really really draining and hard, but it's more important. Yeah, you know. So I find myself having to like check myself and be like, you know what, you don't have to go to that event tonight. You need to go home. You yeah. know, and um, making those sacrifices of like, you know, where is your time? Where are you spending your time? Yeah. And honestly, like family is the best place to put it. Because at the end of the day, I think if I'm sitting on my deathbed, Mm -hmm. doesn't matter how much money is in my bank account, all I would wish for is probably a minute or two more with the people that I love. And that's interesting that we could have it right now, but you choose to 
it's do hard. It's it a is hard, hard. It's such a hard balance. You but know? at the same time, like it is important to live your own life and do your own thing because mm-hmm. you know I don't want my kids to look at me like I'm a loser because I sat on the couch and spent time with them all the time. Right? No, agreed. And like I wasn't happy. I I was definitely. I am more happy now, mm-hmm. feeling fulfilled as like you know, going to work in the day and spending time with them at night, right? Like having this other project, like when I stayed at home, I would say I was definitely like less fulfilled than Mm -hmm. I am being able to have a career. Um, Because like my, my brain and my, like my creative juices, like all of that needs an outlet, needs a project, needs something to be working on. And so I feel like I can be a better mom. I just have to check myself and make sure that I'm not spending more time than I is necessary sure on work stuff I totally totally uh, resonate with that um, my last question to you and we'll kind of wrap up the show sure if you could give any advice mm-hmm. to any young woman man entrepreneur that's growing up wanting to figure out life wanting to get into business wanting to do this if you go back in time and give Angela young Angela mm-hmm. advice um, in today's world, mm-hmm. what advice would you give? Mm. Looking back over the entire journey, yeah. all the decisions that you've made, yeah. this is not only life advice, but maybe some yeah. business advice too. Yeah. Oh, that's a hard one. Um, you know, I would just say, go for it. I feel like so many people don't go do the things that are in their mind to do, the ideas that they have, like explore it, push it. You know, even if it means sacrificing a little bit, you know, I don't want anyone to make a bad business decision, but so many people have so many great ideas and they let fear hold them back. Just follow through with the idea as far as you can go Mm -hmm. and work as hard at it as you can. Um, You know, I feel like there's, especially for food businesses, I'll say this, um, I feel like there's some things that really commit or contribute to success some really and I think a lot of people overlook design I think design in any in any business actually I think design is kind of a crucial aspect that people who don't have a design background or who don't aren't kind of aware that design actually makes a huge difference I could have an amazing ice cream product but if my store looked ugly and if I didn't have the branding like I would not be doing as good Mm -hmm. as I am I come across um, I'm in Facebook groups and things with other ice cream shop owners and I come across comments all the time that are like I don't understand why I'm not doing well I don't understand you know like where we have this great product and it's like if it doesn't look good you know like we eat with our eyes we like we want to be in today's world like in the social media world like design is a really, really important business that I think a lot of people overlook. So I would say, like, make sure that you have, if you're not a design-minded person, like, make sure you have someone that you can turn to to help you with that. Um, I would also say, make sure you have good people in your corner. If you're going to go, like, make sure that the people surrounding you support you and, and can help you. Make sure you have a community or a circle. You know, I have really good friends that can cheer me on, that can be there to, to provide advice, but making sure that your circle, that your network is positive and helping you. And then listen to them. If you've mm. got a lot of people around you that are saying, I don't think that's a great idea, you know, li- like make sure that the people in your inner circle are there to support you and help you and then listen to them you know, 90% of the time. There's going to be 10% of the time where other people are going to doubt you and you're going to, you're going to surpass them, you know, but, um, but I think 90% of the time, if people really care and love you, they're going to, they're going to give you good advice. Yeah. That's really good advice. It sounds to me just in your story that your husband's been an incredible support system to you. And it sounds like you've been an incredible support system to him, like goes hand in hand. Another characteristic of almost everybody I have on the podcast uh, is they got married young and they do have that support system, which has helped them. But it also sounds like your family, mm-hmm. you know, giving you money to start Boomtown. And then mm-hmm. also your brother for telling you straight yeah. up like, hey, you could do this. And you're like, nah, yeah, you can. Yeah. So I do think that is amazing and unique that you do have that support system. So that's also really, really amazing advice. Well, Angela, thank you for being on the Bison Hour. It was yeah. such a pleasure to have you here. It was fun. Anybody in the Oklahoma City area, if you need ice cream, yeah. Boomtown Creamery is the place to go yeah. on 23rd Street yeah. in Oklahoma City, the heart of downtown area. Like yeah. it is uh, an incredible, incredible shop with an incredible product, Thank incredible you. ice cream. So get down there, check it out. Thanks, guys. <laughs>